about uh, the protein and all uh, um, all over structure of protein and uh, protein unfolding. And now we are moving into a greater detail and uh, uh, we have the pleasure to uh, welcome Esko Oksanen, who is the instrument scientist on, on, um, on the beamline for a neutron diffraction in, at the ASS. And he's also very well recognized in the field of uh, uh, protein crystallization and, and uh, using Newton crystallography to unravel uh, the internal secrets of uh, protein. So please, Esko. Well, thank you, Tommy. And um, <clears throat> so um, thanks for giving me the, uh, the opportunity to give you give a talk on this course. And uh, I was asked to talk about protein crystallization, but then uh, after some discussion, we decided that it would be nice to also talk a little bit about protein crystallography with neutrons in general, because there doesn't seem to be really another talk on that. Uh, so, uh, okay. I don't seem to be able to advance my slides now again. Okay. I'm sorry, can you hear me actually? But now because my Zoom is somehow frozen completely, so that I'm not, uh, oh, I'm sorry, a technical problem here. We can see you, but uh, not the... Uh... Can you see the slide? Yeah, I can see the slide and, and you. But it's not changing because uh, it seems like I can't do anything. So do you want to log in again or? Yes, I may have to restart my computer because uh, it seems that uh, I can't do anything. I'm really sorry about that. This because the whole thing is completely frozen. Yeah. So, 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 so the people attending the course, maybe you can think of a clever question for Esco, something that you really want to know about the internal structures of protein, and if you can unravel that uh, with the neutrons. So. I think you get impression that most computers today are tired of Zoom. They are worn out, but all the Zoom activities in the in uh, the Sorry. past year. Now, okay. Yes, now I'm back. Let's see uh, what we get. Uh, sorry for the technical issues. I, I tried to check everything beforehand, and of course that uh, uh, that works only up to a point. So, uh, <clears throat> do you now see the slide and no extras? Okay, um, I still have a, a big uh, box saying the meeting is being recorded in front of me, so I can't see my own slides, but that's fine. Um, yeah, so, um, so I, I thought I would start uh, with a bit of motivation why we want to use uh, neutrons for crystallography, and then uh, talk a little bit about how it is done in practice with a focus on uh, the crystallization part. So first, a little bit of general introduction to how we grow protein crystals to begin with. Um, and uh, Trevor will later today talk about uh, how to make the protein, so I will not touch on that too much. Uh, and then specifically for neutron crystallography, how do we make these crystals very big? Uh, and then I will uh, talk a little bit about the instruments that we use for protein crystallography and, uh, and what we do with the data eventually. Uh, and I would encourage you to ask questions uh, in between, uh, because if you wait until the end, you will probably have forgotten them by the time. So please interrupt, please use the raise hand function in Zoom so it should pop up in front of, in the, at the top of my screen. Uh, don't hesitate to do that. So uh, why do we want to, to use uh, neutrons for uh, protein crystallography? Basically the simple answer is to see hydrogen atoms and hydrogens are about half of the atoms in the typical protein structure and they are often the ones that are interesting for function as we will see. Uh, and in this example, we have a simple um, <clears throat> example of a, of a glutamine residue. Uh, so from this rather high resolution X-ray map, you couldn't really see which one is the nitrogen with two hydrogens and which one is the oxygen with none. Uh, however, if we use neutrons instead of X-rays as the radiation, even at relatively uh, modest resolution and with a rather uh, bad quality map, you could say you can still see very clearly where the nitrogen with the two hydrogens is. So uh, 
the uh, the visibility of uh, hydrogen is very similar to heavier atoms. You may note that the aliphatic hydrogens in this map are not shown. This is because uh, they're actually negative. So they even cancel out some of the density because these have not been exchanged to deuterium. We will talk about later. Um, but um, <clears throat> firstly, a couple of examples of on what kind of systems hydrogen is actually of interest because we don't want to do this just because we can. We want to do it in cases where we are really interested in uh, where the hydrogens are. Uh, and this is an example um, from um, <clears throat> an enzyme that uh, has a different natural substrate, um, but uh, it is actually used to detoxify nerve agents. So it's called isopropyl fluorophosphatase. Um, and uh, there were basically two mechanistic proposals, uh, one of which has a deprotonated aspartate attacking the phosphorus, uh, and another one has an, uh, a hydroxide ion. And uh, the neutron structure clearly shows an H2O or D2O actually um, bound to the, cal the catalytic calcium ion. So it is clearly the mechanism A that is consistent with the experimental data and not B. So uh, the, the objective often is to look at very few hydrogen atoms in a rather large structure. So a few out of several thousand. Uh, another example is uh, from uh, drug development, basically. Uh, so this is from uh, my colleague Zoe Fisher when she was still in the States. Uh, and she was studying an enzyme called uh, carbonic anhydrase 2, which is a drug target for um, a drug called acetazole amide, which you see on the left. And uh, the problem here was that the drug was quite well binding, but not very specific. Uh, because there are many different carbonic anhydrases. And to, uh, to develop it further, it was necessary to know what protonation state it actually has to start sort of uh, computational drug design. And uh, there were three different potential protonation states at the crystallization pH, which was around eight. Uh, and then the, um, <clears throat> the neutron structure clearly showed that uh, it is number three that you actually see in the in the crystal, and of course you see it in the in the crystal in the X-ray crystal structures. Then that you know from your in your X-ray crystal structures, you know what protonation state you have, so you can start doing drug design on it. And so that we have hydrogen here. Uh, I can't I can't point. Can I? You can't see my can't see any pointer. I'm I'm a little afraid to click now because uh, uh, yeah. Uh, anyway, so then uh, the added benefit of doing neutron crystallography is also that we get a full picture of the hydrogen bonding network. And it's uh, interesting to note that uh, usually the hydrogen bonding network is a little bit different from what we would imagine from just taking all the, uh, <clears throat> the donor acceptor distances that you have. So not all the hydrogen bonds that you might imagine are usually formed in a protein. So you always tend to have surprises when you do some neutron crystallography. Um, what is important to understand as well, though, is that uh, neutron crystallography is still something experimentally very difficult. So uh, when I started uh, doing this back in 2003, my supervisor told me that it's conceptually the same as X-ray crystallography, just experimentally about a thousand times more difficult. And if you look at the number of PDB depositions, you now this, this should say 2021, sorry, I did update the numbers, but that didn't update the year apparently. Uh, so uh, the growth of uh, PDB depositions in the last seven to 18 years or so uh, has followed a similar trend. So even if neutron crystallography has remained quite difficult, the number of structures has grown significantly. Uh, so, uh, so it is becoming more possible. It is still not something uh, you would do unless you absolutely have to. So the, uh, the important thing is that you do neutron crystallography, crystallography when you have exhausted the possibilities of X-ray crystallography, basically. And you always do an X-ray structure as well, as we will see. So why is it so difficult? Uh, well, <clears throat> the main reason is, of course, that we have so weak neutron sources. Uh, 
I don't think you had a specific lecture about neutron sources so far, but I think most of you are familiar with the type of neutron sources that we have. But uh, the, in practice, uh, to do protein crystallography, we are still at a level that is below laboratory X-ray sources in practice. So we need very large crystals. Uh, and to make it a little bit quicker, so to do things in weeks instead of months, uh, in some cases, uh, we also use uh, so-called lower diffraction, polychromatic diffraction to have many wavelengths at once. Um, <clears throat> and then we have an added problem, which is incoherent scattering from uh, the light isotope of hydrogen. Uh, and uh, this uh, we can deal with partially by exchanging everything, ev all hydrogens in the sample to deuterium. Um, this we will discuss a bit later. Just to remind you, I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with the concept of incoherent scattering, uh, but um, <clears throat> the um, what happens in incoherent scattering is that the phase of the scattered radiation is randomized. So if you think about Bragg's law, where uh, I guess most of you are familiar with Bragg's law, which basically states that you will have constructive interference between two diffracted rays uh, if there is a specific relation between the angle and the, the repeat distance. Uh, but this is only true if the phase is conserved or changed in the same way for every ray. So if it is randomized, we basically uh, only ever can produce background and not signal for Bragg scattering, which is what we do in crystallography. Um, and uh, the important thing here is that the incoherent scattering cross-section for light hydrogen, 1H, uh, is about 40 times higher than the scattering cross-section for coherent scattering, as you see in the table here on the right. And uh, for deuterium, the situation is somewhat better, uh, where the scattering cross-sections are comparable, it still means we have to deal with a, with a high background technique. Um, <clears throat> so this is really another important challenge uh, in addition to the weak neutron sources. Any questions at this point? Yes? So you said that the... Um... The typical kind of neutron experiment takes, uh, the crystallography experiment takes a very long time. What would be kind of a typical um, measurement time for these crystals? So um, usually something from a couple of days at the shortest to two weeks. It's hard to get uh, allocated much more than two weeks beam time usually. Um, but in in principle, you could collect as long as you, you wanted, but uh, usually there is a there's a diminishing uh, return in having longer exposure times with the detectors that we use. So uh, using exposure times longer than 24 hours uh, is not usually that useful. So uh, it's a question of how desperate you are, but I mean, I would say from three days to three weeks. Is okay, thanks. Good. So then, um, as I was asked to talk about protein crystallization, so um, I, will, I will not talk about how we make uh, pure protein. Actually, crystallizing proteins was first developed to purify them. And crystallization is a very good purification technique. Sometimes, sometimes we even actually reuse uh, more recrystallized protein to purify it. It's not very easy, but uh, it's possible. Uh, and it's interesting that, that protein crystals have been known for much longer than protein crystallography has existed. So uh, um, it, there was in the 20s and 30s, a big discussion about whether proteins have a structure at all. And the fact that there are crystals of proteins and that uh, they, they give rise to diffraction patterns was basically proof that proteins do have a structure. And um, <clears throat> Then, of course, there was the, uh, uh, the big um, breakthrough of having the first protein crystal structure. But uh, uh, the important thing about why we need crystals is that uh, it is a repeating uh, object. Uh, and uh, because either with x-rays or with neutrons, we don't have enough scattering from a single 
molecule, a single object, uh, to get, sign uh, get enough signal. So we have to amplify the signal by repeating the uh, object, the molecule. And if they are randomly oriented, as they would be in solution, we also average all the atomic level positional information. So if you want atomic level information using X-rays or neutrons or basically any other technique, you need some way of uh, amplifying the signal. So the, the crystal is a way of amplifying your scattering signal, basically. Um, and um, <clears throat> how do crystals actually grow? So it turns out that uh, there is an activation energy to forming a crystal, an ordered aggregate. Uh, and uh, and there, is, there are many theories about uh, how this actually happens in practice, but, uh, but you have basically two phases. You have nucleation forming the critical nucleus that can then grow. And then the, the, you don't have the activation energy of growing, of, of getting enough molecules together to actually form a repeating structure. And then you have a, a growth phase where you just add molecules to each surface. So, uh, so this is important that you have nucleation, which is um, a not very well understood step, and then growth that is better understood. And, uh, and we can actually represent this in the form of a phase diagram, which is quite important. So we have on the, um, the y-axis protein concentration, and then on the x-axis we have uh, in here is precipitant concentration, but it could be any other parameter like temperature uh, that we vary. Uh, and it, there could be multiple precipitants, so it could be a multidimensional diagram actually. Uh, and there we have uh, different zones. So we have the undersaturated zone below the, the solubility limit. So this means that existing crystals will dissolve. Uh, then above the solubility limit where existing crystals will actually grow, we will not form any new crystals because we're not above the, uh, the critical concentration of uh, forming nuclei. And above the metastable zone, so existing crystals will grow, but no new ones will form. There is a fuzzy line, uh, a supersaturation limit, uh, after which nuclei start appearing. And the nucleation is a kind of a stochastic process. So you can easily make two drops, two crystallization drops with exactly the same conditions. You get crystals in one, you, you don't get crystals in the other. Um, and then if you put way too much, then you will start forming on uh, disordered aggregates, which we call precipitate. Uh, but, uh, but this is basically the basis of rational understanding of how to grow protein crystals. However, uh, we don't a priori know in what conditions a given protein will crystallize. So, uh, so we have to uh, usually test this uh, with a uh, with an empirical approach and uh, <clears throat> therefore it is usually useful to have a setup or it is very useful to have a setup where we can explore a large um, area of this this phase diagram uh, and this we do typically by vapor diffusion which is quite easy to automate so what you do is you make a on oh, this picture is really bad for some reason um, <clears throat> sorry for that but you you basically uh, you set up your protein solution um, in a drop that is in contact with the reservoir solution in a sealed volume. And uh, then uh, water vapor evaporates from your drop and eventually you reach equilibrium through the vapor phase with your reservoir solution. So your uh, your protein concentration increases and your precipitant concentration increases at the same time. Um, and this we can do in either very small volumes, um, something like uh, 100, 200 nanoliter volumes using a pipetting robot, which you see here in the middle. Um, 
to screen many conditions, or we can scale it up to some microliters, or we can even scale it up further for the neutron crystallization, which you see at the, the bottom, um, where you can fit up to 200 microliters of protein. So, um, so once we, when we embark on uh, solving a neutron crystal structure, we typically already know the crystallization conditions from, from the X-ray structure. So we have somewhere to start from. So I'm not going to talk too much about the screening of uh, crystallization conditions. There are, there's a lot to talk about that as well, uh, but, but I will skip that. However, um, when we start thinking about growing big crystals for neutron crystallography, the first question is to ask how big crystals are actually big enough. How big, big crystals do we need? And um, I'm generally against showing equations in uh, lectures because uh, <clears throat> it tends to be not very efficient. And in this horrible equation, which is basically uh, an equation for um, the, um, the average signal that we get, uh, there is a term uh, that has the number of unit cells, um, which is basically the volume of the crystal divided by the volume of the unit cell. So if we substitute that in, what we get is uh, the volume of the unit cell in the square, in the denominator. Uh, what this means is that the volume of the unit cell is very critical for how big crystals do we need, because if we have a uh, twice as big unit cell, we need uh, four times as big crystals. So uh, the unit cell volume uh, varies a lot depending on the size of the protein itself and also how it ends up being packed. So you can't directly relate it to the size of the protein. So this is why it's important to try and choose crystal forms with small unit cells. And, and this also explains why in some cases you get away with relatively small crystals and in other cases, even quite large crystals don't diffract neutrons well. So uh, in deciding how many, how big crystals do you need, you first need to know what is your unit cell like. Uh, and of course, we try to grow as big, the crystals can't really be too big. So uh, it's more a question of what, what would be sufficient. Now, <clears throat> I think there is something, as somebody asked something in the chat, but I have, don't see the, yes. So um, there was a question about whether defect, defects can form. Uh, yes, they can, uh, but uh, usually if you form large enough defects, that is what stops the crystal from growing eventually. Um, so it is not actually very clear always what controls the quality of a protein crystal, because you have to remember also that protein crystals are, um, they contain up to 70% uh, solvents. So they have solvent contents ranging from 30 to 70%. So it is more like an ordered jelly really than a salt crystal. And um, the, Theoretically, the slower you grow your crystal, the less defects you will have. Uh, but what you have to keep in mind as well is that uh, your protein will not necessarily stay stable in time. So if you would let your, if your, if your protein at the same time aggregates, for example, when your crystals grow, then what might easily happen is that uh, if you try to go through too slowly, then your protein just precipitates because it, it goes old. So uh, um, I think the short answer to this is yes, uh, but it mostly doesn't matter terribly much. So I'm just trying to remove the chat. Never mind. Um, right. So um, when we try to grow uh, large crystals, um, we have a number of tricks that uh, we start trying. And the first one, which is by far the easiest, is to just add more protein to our vapor diffusion drops, which we call feeding. Uh, and this means that in the phase diagram, uh, we move the, uh, the state up again to the, the metastable zone without going above the, the nucleation limit. Uh, 
Uh, and this is really difficult because we don't know where the nucleation limit is. So, uh, so this is something we only really know by trying. In some cases, it works really well. You just add uh, one microliter of protein into your five microliter drop and crystals continue growing. Uh, and then you can, you can let it equilibrate for a week and then add more. Uh, but what it usually, what, how it usually fails is that instead of growing the existing crystals, you get a lot more new crystals. Um, and uh, what is often the case as well is that even before we have started the vapor diffusion process, so we have, when we set up the drop, we're already in the metastable zone. So then nucleation occurs at the same time as the equilibration occurs. So then it's really difficult to know uh, what has happened. So vapor diffusion is a good technique for screening, uh, but it's not very easy to control the conditions there. The second thing uh, that we would try after feeding, if that doesn't work, uh, is uh, simply to scale up the volume. Now you might think it's easier to scale up the volume than, than to start feeding drops, uh, which is true if you have uh, an unlimited amount of protein, but usually you don't. So uh, um, the, um, the effort of, of scaling up is really the effort of producing more protein. And you will, as you will hear from, from Trevor uh, this afternoon, uh, especially if you're dealing with perdutrated protein, this is not necessarily cheap either. So, um, so in scaling up, we, we basically then go to a different type of plate, such as this Manuel sandwich plate. And uh, related to the previous question, uh, it, is, uh, it is actually good that uh, this, the larger the drops, the slower the equilibration. So often just having a bigger drop favors larger crystals uh, because the surface to volume ratio is different. Then uh, it often does happen that vapor diffusion is simply too difficult to, uh, to control to really grow large crystals. So um, the, the main problems are that because the, um, the path along the phase diagram is, uh, is complex and uh, is not uh, reversible. So, uh, so then uh, basically we don't know what is happening when and whatever we try, um, it is difficult to, um, to make crystals grow bigger. And at that point, we typically move to uh, techniques that are more complicated to set up experimentally, but uh, can give us better control and reversibility. And one of them is dialysis, where we basically put uh, the protein solution into a little um, chamber, which we seal off with a semi-permeable membrane, which lets through the, um, the buffer and uh, of course water and the precipitant in some, most cases, but not the protein. And, uh, and this means that by just changing the reservoir solution, we can go back and forth in the, in the phase diagram. And as you can see in the, uh, in the the diagram in the left, uh, we have a different motion because basically the protein concentration remains the same, uh, but we are changing just the precipitant concentration. So we have a different trajectory along the phase diagram, uh, which is not as good for screening crystallization. So it's not as easy to make nuclei, but when we try to grow large crystals, this is actually a good thing. So we can suppress residual nucleation more easily. And then uh, we can even use temperature as a variable when we know the conditions very well. So uh, because the, the play you have with temperature is quite small. So you basically already need to have existing crystals, but by then changing the temperature, either lowering or, or raising it, depending on uh, what uh, type of solubility the protein has, we can actually grow existing crystals very nicely reversibly. Uh, and we've even built uh, automated devices for combining uh, dialysis with, uh, with temperature control to, to combine the two to do this in basically three dimensions. But this requires a well understood and well characterized uh, crystallization system. So, uh, so you have to first have reproducibility in order for this to work. And also significant amounts of, of protein. So, um, 
Uh, so then, um, if we do have large crystals, we still have the issue of uh, the high background from the incoherent scattering. So we can't take our uh, fully hydrogenated crystal in H2O because we would have a horrible background on that. And we, <clears throat> we try to replace all the hydrogen atoms in the sample uh, by, uh, by deuterium. And uh, the simple thing, of course, is to exchange the, uh, the mother liquor, uh, usually by, by vapor diffusion or by just growing the crystals under D2O. Um, and that takes care of something like 95% of the protein of the hydrogens in the beam, because uh, you have to remember that a lot of the protein crystal is water and it is also surrounded by a drop of solvent for it to not dry out. So uh, the actual protein is a fairly small part of the sample in the beam eventually. However, um, it is helpful to uh, also re uh, replace all the aliphatic and aromatic hydrogens in the protein. And in this case, we have to grow the, um, we have to produce the, the protein heterologically in an organism that can grow in D2O. And this is what, what Trevor will talk about uh, later this afternoon. Uh, but uh, I, I want to stress that this is not a requirement for doing protein crystallography. Uh, it is a way of getting away with smaller crystals, but uh, it can be very helpful. So, uh, so we try to do it whenever it's possible. Um, there's a couple of points about um, when you, if you do crystallize under deuterated conditions, because then the protein solubility changes a little bit. And uh, most importantly, pH is not the same as PD. There are formula for, uh, for that uh, difference, but you need, to, you need to take that into account. Uh, and once you do that, it is usually quite easy to reproduce the, uh, the crystallization conditions under deuterated conditions. But the crystals are not necessarily quite as big as under hydrogenated conditions because the protein solubility is actually a bit lower. So we can't get as much protein into the solution. Now, uh, if we have a, a fully hydrogenated crystal grown under hydrogenated conditions, uh, what we usually do is we actually exchange um, the mother liquor with deuterium in the capillary mount where we where we actually collect the data. So before we collect the data, we mount the crystal in a, in a capillary, which you see some pictures of at the bottom. Um, and then because we need to anyway, add some liquid, some well solution uh, to keep the crystal happy and hydrated. So instead of using the reservoir, the original reservoir solution, we make a deuterated version of the reservoir solution, which then through the vapor phase exchanges the hydrogens in the, in the crystal. Uh, so it is always a ba ba bad idea to soak crystals in D2O that were grown in H2O, simply because the osmotic shock uh, between H2O and D2O is so large that you're basically quite sure to, to crack your crystals. So, um, <clears throat> so we want to exchange to deuterium, but we need to do that gently. So once we have uh, grown a crystal, mounted it, exchanged it to deuterium, we would have to go to a uh, beamline, a neutron instrument to collect some data. And uh, there are basically three different uh, types of neutron crystallography instruments around, depending on the neutron source that we use and the technique that we use. So on reactor sources, which are continuous sources, uh, we can either use the monochromatic oscillation method, uh, like we use in X-ray crystallography. The disadvantage there is that uh, we get less neutrons because we throw most of them away in the monochromatization step, but uh, we do have a lower background uh, because we only have background from the wavelength that we use and not all the other wavelengths. Um, 
and we have actually slightly easier to use software uh, for processing the data, so I will show later. Uh, then if we want to make, we want to collect the data as fast as possible, and here the limitation is really usually the time that it would take, that if it would take a month to collect data in a monochromatic beamline, and if we can do it in a week, um, collecting many wavelengths at once using the lower technique, then the lower technique makes sense. So this is why we can uh, we can use smaller crystals in practice. Um, then the back the, the disadvantage is that the data is more difficult to pr uh, process, and we have a higher background because we have background from all the wavelengths and signal for a given reflection only at that particular wavelength. Um, <clears throat> And then using spallation sources, we get in principle the best of both worlds using uh, time of flight lower. So uh, we use all wavelengths at once, but resolve the wavelengths using the neutron time of flight. Uh, I think you will hear about this later. Uh, I will not go into that too much, but uh, uh, in practice, the spallation sources, the existing spallation sources still have relatively weak flux compared to the reactor facilities. So uh, this is still not a huge advantage. It's rather on par with the best reactor instruments. Um, but uh, also the data processing is a little bit more complicated. So, uh, so all of these have their advantages and, and disadvantages, depending on what kind of crystal system you have. Um, then um, one thing about uh, which instrument or the, the neutron instruments that, that is important is the wavelength range that is available. And uh, it is also important to understand what wavelengths do we want to use. And the answer is in, again, in this horrible equation where uh, we have a, a lambda to the fourth term. Uh, and again, this is an equation for our average signal, so to speak. So this is a very strong driver to use as long wavelengths as we possibly can. Uh, the limiting factor there is that is Bragg's law, because if we use very long wavelengths, then all our data is going to be um, at very high scattering angles. So, uh, so this means that uh, we have to strike a compromise, and a reasonable compromise is usually somewhere around uh, two and a half, two point six angstrom, which nicely corresponds with the, the peak of a typical cold moderator spectrum. This is an, an early spectrum, a calculated spectrum from an ESS moderator. But um, <clears throat> we can't go to ridiculously long wavelengths because then we would get, wouldn't get any data. But uh, if we use sort of two and a half angstrom wavelengths, we can still collect data if we have a, a detector that goes all around the sample. Um, and we have much stronger scattering. So uh, where can we practically do this? Um, so to start with the monochromatic reactor instruments, um, there are a couple of diffractometers at um, the Japan Research Reactor in Tokai, which unfortunately is still not operational or is, is closed. Um, well, waiting to be open, so to speak. Uh, so the, the main uh, instrument that, uh, that we use uh, in this is the BioDiff instrument, the FRM2, which you see on the right. Uh, so it is a very simple setup with a uh, monochromator um, and then um, velocity selector for cleaning up the, uh, the beam and then a cylindrical detector around the sample. So you, well, I can't, this is where I would have liked to point. But uh, on the diagram on the right, you can see the, the blue uh, circle is the detector and the sample sits in the middle. Uh, so it's a, it's a cylindrical neutron image plate. Uh, there is also uh, an instrument called D19 at the ILL that is sometimes used for very high resolution uh, protein crystallography work, but because it has a thermal beam, so much shorter wavelengths, uh, it only really works for quite small cells and, and quite large crystals. Um, so then um, moving on to, to Laue instruments, just to repeat that uh, with, uh, with Laue, we have much more uh, reflections to deal with. And it is also more sensitive to the, the crystal mosaicity, which often increases when the crystals grow bigger. Um, 
So the picture on the right is just to show you what we're dealing with. So this is a simulated flower pattern with the wavelength um, color coded. So we're dealing with a lot of reflections. Um, and um, we also, I'm, gonna, I'm not gonna talk about this too much, but uh, in practice, we're not doing full lower in the sense that uh, we are actually limiting the wavelength that we use so that we know what is the maximum and minimum wavelength. So this is why it is called quasi lower. Uh, and this limits um, significantly the, uh, the overlap of these reflections and makes the processing easier. And this is what uh, a typical lower image would look like. So the, uh, if you look at the top of the image, the, that's where you see a lot of the, the small, the weak reflections. That's where the, the real interesting data is, if you will. So the, <clears throat> um, you have quite a lot of reflections to deal with. And uh, the instruments where to do this, um, you have um, the, the real workhorse of neutron protein crystallography has been the LADI-3 instrument at the ILL. And they are commissioning an, another similar instrument now. Um, and it is very similar to BioDiff. It has actually the, the same detector. The main difference is that instead of a monochromator, it has a filter for selecting a wavelength range. Um, so, uh, so we get uh, much more of the spectrum out. And, uh, and the wavelengths here are, can be adjusted by, by moving the filter. And there is a very similar instrument uh, called Imagine at the high flux isotope reactor in Tennessee, in Oak Ridge. Uh, the main difference is basically that the selection of wavelengths is done with a set of mirrors instead of a filter, uh, but otherwise it's actually the, the, the same, uh, the very same detector and readout system. So then um, in the interest of time, which fits well with being time of flight, I will not so, uh, talk about uh, very much about uh, spallation sources, how we resolve the, the wavelengths using uh, time of flight. Um, but basically we can, this means we can spread the background over many time bins and we can resolve uh, eventual spot overlaps uh, using an extra dimension. Uh, and the existing instruments um, at uh, both SNS and uh, J Park are quite similar. It looks like a big hedgehog. So this is something like uh, three meters high. Um, uh, what you see on the right, the detector array of the Mandy instrument. Uh, and you actually have to lower the sample down in an elevator. It goes two meters down in, in, in the setup. So it's quite a quite a thing. Um, and they have similar geometry, different kinds of detectors, but otherwise quite quite similar instruments, both in, in the US and Japan. Uh, what we're building here in Lund uh, is going to be a little bit different. Uh, so uh, because we the ESS source is a little bit different, it's a long pulse source. So the instrument here will be quite a bit longer, uh, 158 meters from the moderator to the sample. Uh, and we will not be putting um, the detectors all around the sample permanently, but rather uh, mounting the detectors on robots so that we can actually work in a much more open geometry. Uh, so this is just a rendering of what the experimental area will look like. And uh, when we have ESS operating at uh, a reasonable power, we should get uh, significantly more flux than existing instruments. So we, we expect to be able to collect data much faster. So the objective is to be able to collect the dates in a day. Um, and just to show you how it looks like, actually not today, we've already built a uh, control hutch uh, here, uh, but it's still, we have some buildings where the experimental area is here, but there's no components in it yet. Um, so, um, <clears throat> So this is still several years away from uh, being operational. Uh, just a few words on the data processing uh, and uh, refinement. So uh, the main, the sort of basic workflow uh, of uh, crystallography, be it X-ray or neutron, uh, is that we have to first uh, find where the diffraction spots are. We have to index them. We have to give them the, have to um, assign um, Miller indices to them and find the unit cell. Uh, and then we have to integrate their intensities, put those intensities on a common scale, 
determine the phases, uh, which is a, a significant uh, hurdle in X-ray crystallography. Uh, and then uh, we computationally refine atomic coordinates to this structure, and then we investigate the maps. Uh, now, there are some challenges compared to X-ray crystallography here. The main ones uh, actually being in integration because we have high backgrounds. So uh, that is uh, the main hurdle. Also, if we do LAWE, we need to scale together multiple wavelengths, which is another step. Uh, one thing we don't need to worry is determining the phases because we always have uh, an X-ray structure uh, of the same thing that we put in the neutron beam. Um, and uh, the refinement is also tricky because uh, we basically halve the data to parameter ratio by increasing the number of atoms uh, by about uh, double. And, uh, and we don't actually have any more data. We have less data than, than we would have in X-ray crystallography. Um, and we, there, we also typically, because of the long wavelengths, we have uh, low completeness of the map, so they're not as pretty. Uh, I will not talk more about that. Uh, but uh, an important thing that we do to, uh, to get around the data to parameter ratio issue is that we actually do joint neutron x-ray refinement. And this means that we never do a neutron structure without doing an x-ray structure, because uh, for this refinement, we ideally want to do it from the same crystal. Sometimes this is a crystal from the same drop. Uh, and importantly, at the same temperature, because we refine uh, temperature factors, uh, atomic displacement factors that are temperature dependent. So uh, the two dates just need to be at the same temperature. So whenever we collect a neutron data set, we try to collect an X-ray data set from the same crystal after the neutron data collection. Or if not, that's not possible, then we collect from a uh, crystal from the same batch. Um, and uh, in addition to the, the joint refinement, we can also use uh, information from uh, high resolution cryo Genic temperature x-rays, for example, in this uh, example of um, an enzyme called urate oxidase, you can see that uh, the neutron map on the, the right is not very, it's not very clear where the heavy atoms are, but once you know where the heavy atoms are uh, from the x-ray map, uh, you can see the hydrogens rather clearly. Um, and, um, <clears throat> and even uh, knowing that, um, you have, for example, water molecules. So uh, on the, the left-hand side, you can see there is a chain of water molecules um, that goes from, from uh, one side of the substrate to the other. Uh, on the neutron map, you see this extension of the density. You wouldn't model, model a water there if you didn't know that there is a water there. But this actually makes sense when we do quantum chemistry calculations, that there is a proton relay. So uh, this type of combining information from x-rays and neutrons is really key for getting the most out of neutrons. So it is not something you ever do um, on its own, basically. Uh, so with that, I would like to thank you for your attention. I'm sorry for going four minutes over time. Um, and uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions you still have. Hi, I have a question. Uh, you say that you want to um, use deuteron to see the crystal structure. And did you, um, can we use the deuterated monomer and then crystal as it tendency structure? Um, so you mean deuterated protein? Yes. Yes, yes. So we can, uh, but we still have to crystallize that deuter or we, we have to have the solvent around it, deuterated, that is more important than having deuterated protein because the, uh, the non-exchangeable hydrogens in a protein are a rather small fraction of the total amount of hydrogen in the sample. Because we have, if we have a, a one cubic millimeter crystal, uh, which has 50% solvent, then we have maybe five times or 10 times more solvent around it just to keep the, the crystal in the capillary, uh, then um, 
it is more important to exchange all the other components than the, the protein um, aliphatic hydrogens. And I have a basic question. Can you give a definition of what is protein crystal? So a protein crystal is um, an ordered array of uh, protein molecules. Um, so it, it, it is a crystal uh, that is held together by, by uh, intermolecular uh, interactions. But uh, what you have to understand is that uh, you have the, the number of interactions holding together a typical protein crystal is uh, similar to what is holding together a typical sugar crystal, but you have about uh, a thousand times more atoms in a, in a protein than you have in a, in a sucrose molecule, for example. Then what is the difference between protein crystal and protein amyloid? Like there are also repeated abrogation of the protein. Yes, but um, if you have like, for example, a fiber, it, has, it is repeating in one dimension it is not repeating in three dimensions. Okay. So, so it's not ordered. It okay. is not ordered in three dimensions. So you can have, you can have, I mean, you can have two dimensional crystals, for example, uh, that is also possible. You can have layer crystals that are uh, ordered in two dimensions and uh, not in the third one. That, that sometimes happens as well. But here we are using 3D crystals. Uh, we have a question in the chat. Um, is neutron scattering better for membrane proteins? So then membrane proteins are really difficult to, to work with. Uh, so uh, there are um, about, uh, I mean, even membrane protein X-ray structures, it is uh, less than I think five percent of the existing uh, protein structures. So, uh, so it is really difficult to to produce them. It is really difficult to uh, to grow crystals at all, uh, and there are no examples yet of of uh, neutron structures of membrane proteins. There is one uh, potassium channel where they've collected some data. Uh, but not, not good enough to, to really determine the structure. Anything else? So can I ask a question, Esko, even if I'm not yes. far from past expiry from being a student? So how much faster will it be to uh, do a diffractogram of a protein with ASS compared to, say, MLZ? So that, that is a, a very tricky question because uh, it depends very much on the, on the protein. And uh, we don't really have a lot of comparative data of, from, of the same crystal from, from different instruments. And because the, the problem is also the crystals are fra fragile enough that when you transport them, they sometimes stop yeah. diffracting as well. So it's not even, I mean, you can't even be sure that you have exactly the same thing. Uh, but the, the, the rough calculation is that uh, ESS operating at five megawatts, uh, we should get something like uh, 17 times more neutrons time averaged um, the, than LADI, which is currently the best instrument, I would say. Uh, and uh, there are different opinions on what is the real gain of using the time of flight. Uh, some say it's a factor of 100. Uh, some say it's a factor of, um, of five, essentially. But um, my take is it, it's the um, basically the ratio of the pulse length to the, uh, the bandwidth. So um, it's about um, a factor of 20. So if we take a factor of 20, then uh, my 
guess is that five megawatts given again there is another thing about the, the detector efficiency so uh which is also and the detector um not necessarily just efficiency but the the stability of the detector how long you have to count to get the background flat so my guess is that we should be able to collect a data set in a day uh that from a crystal that is 10 to 100 times smaller than what we would usually today need for collecting a, a data set in five or six days but that is really difficult to know and it, it's it's difficult to know how it scales with the ess power because it's going to be some time before we operate at five megawatts yeah. so yeah no, it's okay very good there is one in the chat another in the chat so uh yeah about secondary structure so the secondary structure to be honest we see the secondary structure very well from x-ray crystallography so there is no reason to this is not usually something you need neutrons for so uh so we do see of course the i mean you, know, you see the hydrogens i mean the, the 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 hydrogens in uh beta sheets for example are pretty much the first ones you see because they are the best ordered uh, they are also, I mean, in high resolution X-ray structures, these hydrogens are often visible as well. So uh, you don't actually need neutrons to study that, to be honest. Uh, 